It's time for the BOF Breakfast Club, the Business of Fashion's forum for exploring the week's most important fashion news with fashion's most opinionated experts. This week it was wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the Met Ball, overseen by American Vogue's Anna Wintour. Now the single biggest event in the global fashion calendar. What does the power of the Met Ball say about the power of Vogue? Who benefits from all of the attention? And what do we think about the clothes themselves? Also this week, blockbuster cruise shows from Louis Vuitton in Palm Springs and Chanel in Seoul, Korea. In the coming weeks, there will also be globetrotting cruise shows from Dior, Gucci and others. What explains the growing visibility of cruise collections and how do they impact the bottom line? This week, I am joined by Caroline Issa, Chief Executive and Fashion Director of Tank Magazine, Fashion Consultant Mesh Chibber, and Paula Reed, Creative Director of MyTeresa.com. Hello everybody and welcome to The Breakfast Club. The first thing on the agenda today is the Met Ball. And um, I don't know about you, but pretty much everywhere I looked this week, uh, whether that be online or television um, or on social media, it's all it's, that it's people seem to talk about this week was the Met Ball. I think you know, maybe we should go back and talk a little bit about the history of the Met Ball. I mean, you know, Mesh used to go in the early days, right? Well, I don't know if it's the early days, but in the in the late 90s, yeah. I went a couple of times when I was working with John Galliano. And it, what you forget today is that it wasn't always actually Anna Winter's event. Because I, I, until I read about it, I had completely forgotten that the, um, the Dior event had been hosted by Liz Torberis. Yeah. Because now you just assume it is Anna Winter's event. And that's when Princess Diana went. The Liz Torberis event was, yeah, the 50th anniversary of Dior and, 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 and um, the dress that was made for Princess Diana. And clearly that's changed, right? I mean, the headline in the New York Times this week was something like, it's the Met Ball, but it's really Anna Wintour's party. You know, what do you think, what do you think the Met Ball and all of the interest in the Met Ball says about the power of American Vogue? Well, I think it's, it's also a reflection of the fact that the industry has become so corporate and she's understood that and she's harnessed it because mm -hmm. the Met Ball generates so much money for the museum. In that sense, it's a massive success. But I think it's a reflection of the fact that our industry has become far more corporate and you know these tables have been taken by all of the brands. I think they get their entire annual funding budget from that one event, don't they? I mean, that's a barnstorming success. Yeah, I mean, a I, I think it was also in the New York Times article that was reading the kind of the proceeds generated by similar gala events in New York, and yeah. this was far and away by far the most, um, you know, the most money raised by a single event. I'm not sure if the entire budget mm. comes from there, but it's certainly a very significant portion of it. But you know, it's interesting because you have these different stakeholders, all of whom are are getting something out of it. So on the one hand, you have you know the Met, which sometimes gets a little bit lost in the flurry of other stuff. But you have you know the the money that's raised for the Met. You have Vogue, you have the celebrities, and then you have the designers. And somehow, the whole thing kind of comes together in this you know tornado of 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 activity that you know it, it, it's like a feeding frenzy almost. But it's I think it's I think it's win win for everybody yeah. involved. I think it's an incredible uh, platform for Vogue. So it was incredibly smart mm -hmm. to think of both Anna Winter and Conde Nast to really take control and have a point of view as to you know who they invite and um, the scenario and what it looks like. And it's yeah. a fantastic platform for the Met as well. Okay. Well, I know this isn't fashion police, um, but I think <laughs> I think it is worth talking a little bit about some of the clothes. Mm -hmm. um, it does seem that because it, it, it is growing in, in visibility and you know it is the Oscars of the fashion industry that that red carpet moment that happens outside is becoming a more and more important part of it. That's got to be the scariest red carpet in yeah. the world. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's kind yeah. of crazy. And so all of the rumors this week were that, um, you know, Rihanna was supposed to show up last, um, but Beyonce also wanted to show up <laughs> late. Mm -hmm. So apparently Beyonce showed up intentionally late and the photographers were warned that she was coming late. But, um, you know, and clearly because everything is timed so perfectly, you know, it threw things off kilter a bit. But, you know, I have two very well-dressed, elegant women with me today, and you know, a very discerning young man. You know, 
did you what did you think about how the designers are using that opportunity to 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 show clothes I think the designers are using the opportunity to show more body than anything yeah. else uh -huh. there was a fabulous tweet that I saw where um there was a comparative picture of the front row of the Porn Stars Awards <laughs> <laughs> and then the arrivals at the Met mm. and the comment was that the Porn Stars were actually showing less flesh than, mm. than those arriving at the Met. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a perfect opportunity for people to show the ultimate of their craft and, you know, all eyes on that red carpet. But it is interesting to me that there seem to be less and less dress yeah. and more and more flesh. And more and more booty. Yeah. I mean, especially, you know, especially the, the, the outfits that were worn by Beyonce, um, Kim Kardashian, J -Lo. and J-Lo. Yeah. And they were all quite similar. Yeah. I mean, do you think that really works for, say, Pucci or Givenchy to, or Cavalli to be associated with that kind of... Do you think people, it even registers in people's minds that those are the brands behind those outfits? It doesn't well, seem to reflect the brand to me in any yeah. way. Exactly. Well, you will see it because that photo will go everywhere with the name Givenchy under it. Yeah. So even if they don't, you know, they look at it, they don't know, that image is usually attached to the, the, the brand name as well. Yeah. But it's definitely not personifying, I think, the brand and mm -hmm. sort of the DNA that I think the fashion press and p typical consumers, I think, associate with. Brands. But you know, Bob Mackie and Cher did that dress in 1974. Yeah. Yeah. So it's nothing new. And you know, Cher is, has always been, you know, a costumed kind of shock tactic and always gotten the front pages. And I think. And you Caroline, know, you're so right because it was absolutely shocking yeah, when yeah. she was doing I mean, she really yeah, at commanded that time, yeah. the center of attention. Yeah. But so. Well, interestingly, Cher made an appearance at the Met Ball yeah, for the first time yeah. in a very long time yeah. um, this year, and you know, she wasn't showing. No, wearing a lot more than she a lot of others. She was wearing yeah. a lot more. Yeah. Um, I, <clears throat> I do think you know um, what you mentioned, uh, Paula, is, is quite interesting because there does seem to be a significant disconnect between what the brands stand for, say, in their campaigns or on their in their runway shows, and then what ends up on the red carpet. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, to me, it feels almost like it's indivisible, you know, one flesh-coloured embroidered piece of tulle from another. I mean, of course, the brand has been talked about, so Pucci, 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 Givenchy, 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 but I can't remember which dress was which, to be right. really honest I just sort of remember Helen Mirren's red Dolce Gabbana dress, because it just looks so chic. Yeah, yeah, yeah she did. So she that, to amazing. me, that's just, just the, it, the one dress that I remember from all of yeah. that is probably the, the chicest one. And the Rose Byrne dress. I think it was Calvin yeah. Klein, yeah. So, you know, you, there are certain women who kind of um, kind of personify elegance on that catwalk. Yeah. And there's also that sense, you know, that kind of the, the, I suppose that photo moment where you want something a little bit outrageous. But I thought Moschino did it really well with um, yes. Katy Perry's dress. There's that sense of humor, and I'm sure it would be a great photo opportunity. And Madonna well. did a, a dress with um, Moschino Kino. as well. And you, you know, Jeremy Scott and the, the yeah. two pop icons together, that, that works quite well because you kind of remember it, but I don't know. I think the strategy of you know, removing more and more um, mm. garment or fabric from the outfits, you know, eventually they're just going to be walking out like the, the porn stars. <laughs> <laughs> no, the porn stars are completely covered yeah. Yeah. Reversal. If you all recall, Chanel had this plan to, to do this big show in Korea and then it was only I think part way through the process that everyone discovered that actually there's going to be a major fashion scheduling conflict. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, the show in Seoul, Korea that Chanel did went on and then a couple of days later uh, Vuitton did their cruise show in Palm Springs. Um, <clears throat> you know, Chanel started the trend of this or, or the, 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 the strategy of, of showing these cruise collections in glamorous exotic locations and Caroline you've been to several mm -hmm. of these kinds of uh, shows. In yeah. You know, I think it's it's um, it's entertainment at this point. I think the the big brands, Chanel, Dior, um, Vuitton, now Mimi's on board with Cruise as well. You know, it's becoming like they've got bigger and bigger missiles and more and more money spent, and it's becoming kind of entertainment. And um, the fashion is almost kind of by the side, but they are incredible productions. 
and so many fashion press are flown in. But I also think it's really interesting and, and probably most important that actually VIP clients are there mm -hmm. versus kind of during the runway shows when it's very press and buyer oriented. But these are, these are mega productions and they're kind of incredible, immersive entertainment pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but they get bigger and bigger and I think by the wayside, smaller brands just cannot compete with what the super brands are doing. Well, of course, there, there is a commercial reason for it, right? As you say, that, you know, the clients are there, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, having attended a couple of the shows myself, um, you know, most of the chief executives, you know, what the thing they seem to emphasize, and we spoke to some of this week, so some of them this week, is that actually it's one of the best moments to engage with top clients. Mm -hmm. Apart from the engagement with the the kind of VIP clients, the other thing is actually, as we all know cruise collections are sitting on the shop floor for much longer and up until now there was no communication about them and it was Chanel as I said that spotted this opportunity to communicate about the shows and kind of carve out this moment you know outside of the crowded fashion week calendar to to kind of engage with clients and the fashion press and you know emphasize these these collections but I wonder you know with all the brands doing these shows now and you know amping up the production values and taking it you know to a whole new level it seems every season do you think there's a point where it just it loses its impact well they i mean they, they've chosen strategically important cities in evolving markets for them so seoul is a massively i mean korea is a massively important market mm -hmm. Um, so it's not surprising that they will, that, you know, Chanel have always been, Buna Pavlovsky has always been very, very astute in kind of following the trend of their kind of emerging markets. But and for, and as an experience and as a touch point with that brand, it's perfect. I mean, it's, a, it, as you said, totally immersive experience. But for people in Seoul who are not yeah. anyway connected with, you know, the Paris fashion mm. circus, that's an incredibly Im important kind of exposure to the brand. For those of us on the circuit, the idea of traveling to yet another city, and now London is going to have, you know, resort collections. Exactly. It can feel a bit wearying, like, oh God, yet another one. But those resort collections, they are gathering in strength, commercial strength, more and more and more. They're a significant part of our buy. And still, the buy, on the investment mm -hmm. in resort is way more than what it is in um, collections. Can you, uh, Paula, because you, you know, at, at, at a place like My Teresa, or even you know, at Harvey Nichols where you were before, I mean, can you talk a little bit about you know, why these collections have become so important? You know, what is it about them that makes them so commercially significant? Well, you touched on it. They, they sit on the shop floor for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So they tend to also be um, much le more of a kind of reflection of the DNA of the brand in a, in a wearable sense. So where you get all that kind of hoopla on the catwalk, and that's a real statement, it feels almost like street fashion or some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Those are the headlines. And then underneath that, I don't mean to say underneath in a, in a kind of disparaging way, but behind that is the real meat and potatoes of um, the commercial kind of driving force of the brand. And that, I mean, a lot of people will say that that ratio of 70 to 30% still sits among you know, most people's investment kind of works out that way. So 70% to resort collection or pre-collection. and In terms 30, of overall buy. In terms of overall buy, and then 30% for catwalk. So that is a massive, massive investment. I also suppose in terms of social media, they generate amazing images. Because mm. they're, you know, they're not in the normal cities. Like you said, they're huge productions. So if you're these me big mega brands, it's another opportunity to create some incredible images. It's a pure marketing platform, and I think the investment that goes into it now is is completely has so much impact when it comes to all the assets that come out of it. Mm -hmm. They give you more four times a year now, mm -hmm. more voice than um, other brands. So I think you know the big brands now have got a lot more space and airtime within social media, etc. Yeah, because they're apart from the yeah. general circus. I yeah. mean, the, you know, when Chanel was doing it all by themselves, it was like yeah. it was t unique. Yeah. You know, aside from a very crowded schedule, they got a chance to actually express the values of their brand. And this thing was like a kind of glamorous yeah. oasis really <coughs> in the middle of nothing. Now the space has become much more yeah. crowded, mm -hmm. but it really is almost like a power play among mm -hmm. the brands to see mm -hmm. who can do it more yeah. impressively. But this does beg 
the question, when do designers have time to design? Exactly. <laughs> or to reflect yeah, on what they terrifying. want to design, because they're yeah. constantly just mm. working on a collection. When do they have time to reflect? Mesh, do you remember when this whole idea of the, the kind of <coughs> pre-collections or cruise collections first started to emerge in fashion? And what the original reason that they, they, they emerged? I'm assuming it was really the American department stores, the need, they, they had a clientele that needed... Which is why it's called resort. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> four times and a cruise, year. Yeah. Or they, <laughs> there was demand for it. There was a market for it that hadn't been addressed, and I suppose it's grown from that. And like you said, it, it, you know, it takes up 70% of the budget. Right, but it was it. one thing when those collections were, you know, commercial collections based on the DNA of the brand, which were, didn't require some huge creative spectacle. But now, you know, I think Chanel does six major shows a year. So that means, you know, yeah. Karl Lagerfeld's working on six shows a year. Uh, and many of the other brands have followed suit. So as you say, you know, it's created this, you know, pressure, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, every two or three months you have to put on a massive spectacle. I think it's huge pressure on the designers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they're constantly having to deliver something that's yeah. not only going to, you know, sell well, but also generates yeah. media attention. And it's interesting how it's affecting the, it's interesting how it affects how we relate to the clothes as well, because as these things become huge spectacles, somehow it's, it's like the clothes become, you know, headline grabbers. Mm -hmm. And you, when you're just in the market for a really cool dress, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know, everything seems to be, it has to make a statement because you have to make a statement to be heard above the white noise of everything that's going around. I tend to buy, when I invest in designer clothes, tend to buy resort or pre-collection because it is more low-key. But what worries me is, it's, it's harder and harder just to get simple clothes that, because everything has to make such a massive statement. Lee Edelcourt controversially said not so long ago, fashion is deeply out of fashion. And, yeah. and the, the point that she was making was that everything has become such a kind of hoopla and almost show business. Entertainment. Mm. Yeah, and absolutely, entertainment. That, you know, that kind of quiet quality of dressing a woman and filling her wardrobe with things that she has daily need for mm. somehow kind of slips a little bit into the background. It's interesting. Yeah, it's it? in a way because over time this idea of the collections being kind of this commercial element of the collection that didn't require all this communication has been co-opted for reasons, different reasons, which is, you know, as you say, to feed the, in the f to feed the feed, as we say in the office sometimes, mm -hmm. to constantly, you know, keep those social media feeds, um, you know, filled with imagery and, and, and assets that can, you know, drive a conversation. But interestingly, you know, we spoke to Michael Burke um, last week about the Vuitton show and th they did their very first uh, cruise show in Monaco last year. It was, in a way, it was an experiment for them. And he said that, you know, overnight it became the single most important collection for them and that, you know, wow. the, store, the store in Monaco was mobbed. He said he's expecting the same thing to happen in their LA store yeah. this time. So, you know, you know, perhaps it's you know something that we're just you know going to have to get used to. Uh, they are platforms for communication, but they're also still powerful commercial platforms. Yeah. That's all the time we have for the Breakfast Club this week, the Business of Fashion's forum for exploring the week's most important fashion news with fashion's most opinionated experts. Please subscribe to the Business of Fashion on YouTube and stay tuned for more Breakfast Clubs in the future.